Welcome to this week's Read Aloud. As we left off last week, Jupiter had hurt himself. So Peter and Bob had to go back to the castle that same day to find out what's going on. So we'll pick up with Chapter 12. Chapter 12, The Blue Phantom. Darn it, Pete said. When we have an argument, why does Jupe always win? He won this one all right, Bob agreed. There, in front of them, was Terror Castle, perched on the canyon walls, its towers, broken windows, and coverings of old vines were sharp and clear in the late afternoon sunlight. Bob shivered a little. Uh, maybe we should go in, he said. It's only two hours to sunset. It'll be dark before we know it. Pete looked back down the boulder-covered road. Behind the bend, Worthington was waiting for them in the car. He had helped Bob over the worst rocks. Then he had had to return to guard the car, according to his employer's orders. Do you suppose Skinny Norris followed us this time? Pete asked. No. I was watching behind us, Bob said. Anyway, Jupe is sure Skinny is going to give Terra Castle a wide berth from now on. But we have to prove we have more nerve than Skinny. Bob had the camera and Pete was carrying the tape recorder. They both had torches attached to their belts. Together, they climbed up the steps to the big front door. It was shut. Huh, and that's funny, scowled Pete. I'm positive Skinny didn't close the door when we saw him run out the other day. Uh, maybe the wind blew it shut, Bob said. Pete turned the knob. The door opened with a long screech that made them jump a little bit. Huh, just a little rusty hinge, Bob said. Nothing to make us nervous. But who said I was nervous? Pete asked. They went into the hall, leaving the door open. Off to one side of the hall, there was a big room filled with old furniture, massive carved chairs and tables, and a huge fireplace. Jupe told them to look around and take pictures. Bob didn't see anything very special about the room but he took two photos with the flash camera. Then they went on around the hall where Jupe and Pete heard the echoes. It was an eerie, gloomy spot where the suits of armor and the pictures of Mr. Terrell in fantastic costumes. But a few rays of sunshine coming through the dusty window halfway up the stairs lightened the atmosphere a little bit. Uh, pretend it's a museum, Bob told Pete. You know how a museum feels. There's nothing scary about that. Yeah, that. Yeah, that's right, Pete agreed. Th this place does have that museum feeling. All dusty, old, and dead. Dead, 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 dead. The word rang in their ears. Wow, Bob said. The echoes. Echoes. Walls answered. Pete pulled him to one side. Come over here, he said. You only hear the echoes when you stand in the one spot. Ordinarily, Bob liked echoes. He liked to yell, hello, and hear the echo answer back with a far off hello. But somehow, he didn't feel like testing the echoes in Echo Hall anymore. Hey, let, let's look at the pictures, he suggested. Which one looked at you with the living eye? Over there, Pete pointed across the room to a picture of a one-eyed pirate. One minute, the eye was alive, and the next, it was just painted. Hmm, that's something we can investigate, Bob said. Stand on a chair and see if you can reach it. Pete pushed a carved chair beneath the picture, but even on tiptoe, he couldn't reach the painting. There's a sort of balcony above, Bob said. The pictures are hung by long wires from the balcony. Maybe if we go up there, we can pull the picture up. Pete started to get down from the chair, and Bob turned sideways toward the staircase. Just as he turned, he felt somebody grab his camera by the leather strap hanging over his shoulder. At the same instant, he caught a glimpse of a tall figure standing in the dark, little above him. He let out a yell and started for the door fast. But he didn't get very far. The camera strap jerked him back and he lost his balance, falling on his side on the marble floor. 
As he fell, he could see an enormous figure lunging for him. It was somebody in the armor, swinging a huge sword straight down towards his head. Bob gave another yell and scooted along the floor on his side. The great sword struck the floor with a clang, right on the spot where Bob had been lying. The fellow in armor followed, crashing onto the marble with a noise like a barrel full of tin cans falling over a cliff. By this time, the camera strap had finally worked its way off Bob's shoulder, so he kept on sliding along the floor until he came up against the wall. He looked back, expecting the man in armor to come after him. But what he saw instead practically made his hair stand on end. The armor's man's head had fallen off and rolled across the floor. Then Bob took a closer look and discovered that the suit of armor was empty. The helmet had come loose and bounced across the floor after him. And when the suit of armor fell over, he stood up and dusted himself off. His camera head was lying beside the armor, the strap still tangled in the metal links where it had gotten caught and where he had backed into the alcove. He picked it up and took a picture of Pete, laughing his head off. Now I have a picture of the laughing phantom of Terror Castle, Bob said. Jupe will enjoy this one. Sorry, Bob, Pete said, and wiped his eyes and got back to normal. But you did look funny, puffing that ru rusty suit of armor after you. Bob looked down at the armor on the floor. It had been standing on a little pedestal in the niche in the wall, and now it had come apart, of course. It was a little rusty, but not too bad, and too bad of a state. He took a picture of it, and then a picture of the one-eyed portrait on the wall, and a couple of other paintings. <sighs> if you're finished laughing, he said, here's a door we didn't notice. It has a little sign on it that says but he had to squint to read the engraving on the little brass plate. It says, Projection Room. Pete came over. Dad said that in the day, old days, all the big stars had their own projection rooms in their homes. They used to show their own pictures to their friends. Let's see what it looks like. Bob had to pull the hard on the door. It came open slowly as if someone was holding it from the other side. As it opened, a little breeze of stale, damp air rolled out at them. The room beyond was as black as the inside of an alligator. An enormous figure was lunging towards him. Pete unfastened his torch and threw a strong beam, enabling them to see that the projection room was a big room with about a hundred plush lined seats in it. Far over on the other side, they saw the indistinct outline of a large pipe organ. The place is all fixed up the way movie theaters used to be, Pete said. Look at that pipe organ. It's about ten times the size of the one that Mr. Jones brought. Let's look it over. Bob tried his torch, but it wouldn't work. He had apparently broken it when he fell down, but Pete gave plenty of light. They marched across the back of the projection room and up to the old pipe organ. They weren't nervous now. Bob's comical tangle with the empty suit of armor had buoyed their spirits. The old pipe organ, with huge pipes stretching up to the high ceiling, was dusty and covered with cobwebs. Bob took a picture of it for Jupiter. They looked round once more. The plush seats were all decayed where the movie screen should have been. There were just some white strips hanging down. The longer the two boys stayed there, the staler and damper the air seemed to get. Nothing in here, Pete said. Let's see what's upstairs. They left the projection room and went back into Echo Hall and started up the steps that curved around one side of the hall. Halfway up, where the sun was shining through the dusty window, they stopped to look out. The castle wall was right up against the steep, rocky sides of Black Canyon. We still have almost two hours of daylight, Bob said. Plenty of time to look around. Let's have a better look at that pirate picture then, Pete suggested. We can pull it up and see if there's something funny about it. When they reached the balcony, they found that all the pictures were hanging from the molding just below the balcony. Together, they grabbed the wires and began to hoist. The pirate picture had a heavy frame, but they finally managed to pull it up high enough to turn the torch on it. It was just an ordinary picture, a little shiny because it was painted with oil paint. Bob suggested that the shininess 
might have made Pete think he saw a living eye staring at him, but Pete looked doubtful. I got it. I really thought it was alive, he said, but I guess I was wrong. Well, let's put it back. They lowered the portrait into place, and they went up the next flight of stairs. They were going to start at the top and work their way down. They kept on climbing flights of stairs until they found themselves inside a little round tower high up on the top of the castle. It had narrow windows like a real castle, except that there were panes of glass in them. The two boys looked down. They were above the top of Black Canyon, and for a distance of several miles, they could see hills and more hills rising into the horizon. Then Pete let out an exclamation. Look, he said, a television aerial. He was right. On the top of the ridge nearest to them was a television aerial put up there by someone who lived down the next canyon and couldn't get a good reception. There's another canyon there, quite close, Pete said. It, it isn't as lonely here as it looks. There are dozens of canyons running into these mountains, Bob told him. But look how steep the ridge is. Nobody but a mountain goat could get over the top. You'll have to go around. Yeah, you're right, Bob said. Well, nothing up here. Let's start down and see what we can find that Jupe might want to know about. On the floor below, they came to a hall. And down the hall, a door was open. They looked in. It must have been Stephen Terrell's library, the place where he had left his farewell note because there were hundreds of books on the shelves, more pictures similar to the ones down in Echo Hall, but smaller, hung on some of the walls. We'd better look this over, Pete decided. So they went in. The pictures were very interesting. They all showed Stephen Terrell in scenes from his movies. In every picture, he looked different. He was a pirate, a highwayman, a werewolf, a zombie, a vampire, a monster from the ocean. Bob wished he could have seen these movies. They called him the man with a million faces, he reminded Pete, as they went from one picture to the other. Chief, look at that. They'd come to a mummy case a little above. It was a real Egyptian mummy case, like those often seen in museums. The lid was closed, and there was a silver plate attached to it. Pete turned his torch on the plate, and Bob squinted to read what was engraved there. It said, The contents of this case were willed by their owner, Mr. Hugh Wilson, to the man who gave him so much entertainment, Mr. Stephen Terrell. Whiskers, Pete said. What do you suppose is inside? Maybe a mummy, Bob suggested. It could be something valuable. Let's have a look. They began to push up the lid of the mummy case. It wasn't locked, but it was quite heavy. They had it about halfway up when Pete gave a yell and let the lid go. <gasps> Did you see what I saw? He said. Bob swallowed a couple times. I saw it. It's a skeleton, he said. A nice shiny white skeleton grinning at us. I guess that's what Hugh Wilson willed to Stephen Terrell for giving him so much entertainment. Bob told him. His skeleton. Let's open up the case so I can take a picture of it for Jupiter. Pete didn't really want to, but Bob reminded him that a skeleton was nothing more than some bones and can't hurt anyone. They opened the mummy case again, and Bob was able to take a good picture of the grinning skeleton. He was positive Jupe would be interested. While Bob was winding on the film and slipping in a new flash bulb, Pete wandered over by a window. He looked out and gave a yell. We better hurry, he said. It's getting dark. Bob looked at his watch. It, it can't be. It's more than an hour to sunset. Well, maybe the sun doesn't know that. Take a look. Bob limped over to the window. Sure enough, it was getting dark outside. The sun was disappearing behind the canyon wall. The only reason it was still shining in the window was because Terra Castle was built so high up on the ridge. Oh, I forgot the, about the sun setting early in these canyons, he said. That makes a difference. Let's go, Pete said. I don't want to be in a, this place after dark. They headed for the hall. And as they looked up down the long corridor, they saw that there were stairs at both ends. They couldn't figure out which set of stairs they had used before. So Pete finally picked the ones that were the nearest. 
By the time they reached the floor below, the light was getting much dimmer, and they couldn't seem to locate a staircase that would take them down. Finally, they found a narrow set of steps near the far end of the hall behind a door. But this isn't the way we came up, Bob said. <clears throat> Maybe we ought to go back. All stairs go down, Pete answered, and down is where we want to go, and fast. Come on. They started down. As soon as they let go of the door, a spring closed it, and they were in pitch darkness on the narrow stairs. We better find the way we came up, Bob said uneasily. I don't like this darkness. I can't even see you. You don't like it. I don't like it. That makes it unanimous, Pete said. Where are you? His fingers reached for Bob. Okay, all right, let's not get separated. Back up and open the door. Together they climbed back, climbed back up the door, but the knob refused to turn. Oh, I guess it locks on this side, Bob said, trying to sound calm. It looks as if we're going to have to go down this way, whether we like it or not. We need some light, Pete said. If we could just find a... Hey, what's the matter with me? I have a torch, a nice new torch. Well, go on, switch it on, Bob urged him. This darkness seems to be squeezing in on us. It, it's getting a lot blacker, too. Correction, Pete sounded a little shaky. I haven't got a torch after all. Re remember when we were shutting that mummy case? I must have left it up there. Oh, great, Bob said. Wonderful, and mine's busted when I was knocked down by that suit of armor. Well, maybe it was just shaken up, Pete suggested. That happens. His hands grabbed Bob's torch off his belt. Bob could hear him slapping it. For a long minute, nothing happened. And then it came on. Not a real strong light, but just a feeble glow. Mm, it's a bad connection, Pete said. About as good as a candle, but, but it's light. Come on, let's go. They went down the long, narrow, winding stairs faster than Bob thought was possible with the brace on his leg. Pete led the way with the feebly glowing torch. At last, they got down to where there were no more steps, and they decided it must be on the ground floor. Shining the light around as well as they could, they were just able to make out that they were in a small, square hall with two doors. As they were trying to decide which door to try, Pete grabbed Bob's arm. Listen, he said. Do you hear what I hear? Bob listened, and he heard it. Faint, weird organ music. Somebody was playing the ruined pipe organ in the projection room. Suddenly, Bob felt the extreme nervousness that Jupiter had mentioned. Uh, it's coming from that direction, Pete whispered. Uh, pointing to one of the doors. So, so let's go that way. Let's go that way. And Bob pointed to the other door. No, this way, Pete said, because this way must lead us to the projection room. And we know that the front entrance is outside the projection room. The other way might get us completely lost. Anything's better than that. Pete op pulled open the door and res resolutely started down a dark hall, holding on to Bob's hand. As they progressed, the music got louder but it still sounded far away, like, like ghost music, full of screeches and wails. Bob kept going because Pete wouldn't let him stop, but the closer they got to the music, the more extremely nervous he felt. And then, Pete pushed open the door, and they found themselves in the projection room itself. They could tell it was the projection room, because the dull glow of the torch gave enough light to show them the backs of the seats. Down at the far end, Near the pipe organ, there was a blue glow. It hung in the air some four feet off the ground, more blob-shaped than anything, and, and it seemed to shimmer. And as it shimmered, the ruined pipe organ gave out more ghostly wheezes and screeches. <laughs> the blue phantom, Bob gulped. That was the moment when his feeling of extreme nervousness that had become acute anxiety turned into sheer terror. Just as Jupiter Jones hoped would happen, they raced across the room towards the door where they knew was there. Pete shoved it open, and they were out in Echo Hall. Both boys headed for the main entrance, where the door was still open, and burst out onto the tiled terrace. Once there, 
they kept on going. But Bob's bad leg dragged a little, and his foot hit a crack. He stumbled. Pete was running so fast he didn't notice. Bob went over, landing on a pile of leaves in a corner of the terrace, and instantly dug them into his, like a mouse hunting for cover. As he waited for the blue phantom to come over him, his heart pounded like a compressed air drill, and he was panting so loudly he couldn't hear anything else. When he realized that, he held his breath, and in the sudden stillness, he could hear the blue phantom hunting for them. It was coming closer and closer with little slithery steps on the tiles. Its breathing was gaspy and ragged and strangely sinister and scary. And suddenly, the footsteps stopped. The thing was standing directly over him. For a long moment, it stood there, still breathing in great gasps. And then it went down and grabbed Bob's shoulder. When he felt it, Bob let out a yell that practically rattled the rocks off the nearest hillside. Chapter 13. The Sign of the Investigators. And what happened after the blue phantom touched your shoulder, Bob? Jupiter was speaking inside headquarters. The three investigators were holding their first meeting in three days. Pete had been away on a trip with his father and mother to visit relatives in San Francisco, and Bob had been swamped with work at the library, re-cataloging all of the books. One other helper was off sick, so Bob had been working days and evenings, too. Meanwhile, Jupiter had been stuck in bed, letting his ankle heal and reading books. This was the first chance they had gotten together in private. Well, Jupiter asked again, what happened? You mean after I yelled? Bob sounded reluctant to continue the conversation. Precisely, after you uh, yelled. Why don't you ask Pete, Bob said, ducking the question. It happened to him, too. Okay, very well. You tell me what happened, Pete. Pete looked sheepish, but obeyed. Um, I fell down, he said. Bob shouted so loudly when I grabbed his shoulder that I startled, was startled, and I fell on top of him. And then he started to struggle and yell. He, he kept yelling, let go of me, Phantom. You better back inside where you belong if you know what's good for you. My arms were all bruised trying to get a hold of him until I could make him understand it was me and come back to see what had happened to him. Bob has the heart of a lion, despite his small stature, Jupiter said. So you discovered he wasn't with you and you turned back to find him. He heard you breathing hard and thought it was the Phantom when you bent down to touch him, correct? Bob nodded. Mm. He had felt rather foolish there in the leaves when Pete had, and he had finally gotten untangled. For a moment, he had really thought he was fighting the blue phantom. Jupiter pinched his lip together. He was looking satisfied about something. And when you finally stopped fighting each other, he said, you discovered something else. You discovered, did you not, that the feeling of extreme terror had disappeared? Pete and Bob looked at each other. How had you figured that out? They were saving it up to surprise him. Yeah, that's right, Pete said. It had gone away. So, the sensation does not extend beyond the walls of Terror Castle, Jupiter said. That's a significant discovery. It is? Bob asked. I'm positive of it, Jupiter said. The photographs should be ready for examination now. Will you bring them from the dark room, Pete, while I shut the ventilator? Uncle Titus is creating quite a racket outside. He was right about his Uncle Titus. Mr. Jones had finally managed to assemble the pipe organ he had bought. He, when confined to bed, Jupiter had been reading a library book about pipe organs, and he had given his uncle a good deal of advice. Now Mr. Jones was testing the reassembled organ he was playing. Asleep in the Deep, a favorite of piece of Hans and Conrad, and he was giving full power to all the deep bass notes, along with very quavery accompaniment to go along with the main tune. The boys had the roof ventilator of headquarters open, so they were getting the full benefit of the playing. 
When Mr. Jones really dug down into the low notes, things inside headquarters positively rattled. Bob felt as if the music was trying to lift him right out of his chair. It seemed to make him quiver all over. By the time Jupiter had closed the ventilator, shutting out some of the din, Pete came back from the dark room with the prints of the photos Bob had snapped inside of Terror Castle. They were damp, but they could be studied. Jupiter examined them under the big reading glass, and then he passed them on to Pete and Bob. He spent most of the time on snapshots of Mr. Terrell's library and the suit of armor that had chased Bob. Very well done, Jupiter said, with one exception. You failed to get a picture of the blue phantom seated at the keys of the ruined pipe organ. <sighs> Did you expect me to walk down and photograph a shimmering blob playing an organ that can't be played? Bob sounded a little sarcastic. Nobody would have stopped to take a photo, Pete said. There were too much extreme terror in the atmosphere. You wouldn't even have done it, Jup. Hmm. No, I suppose not, Jupiter agreed. It is hard to act with composure when the, in the grip of fear. Still, such a picture would have done much to solve our problem. Pete and Jup and Bob waited. Jupiter had had three days in bed to think, and he must have done a lot of thinking that he wasn't telling them about just yet. You see, Jup added, your adventure was very unusual in one respect. The Phantom of Terror Castle actually appeared to you before sundown. Well, it was sundown inside, he told him. It was darker than a black cat in a coal mine. Well, nevertheless, the sun was still shining outside. No one else has reported any manifestations before nighttime. Well, let's see what the other pictures tell us. He picked up the one of the suit of armor. This armor, he said, it looks fairly shiny, not rusty. It wasn't very rusty, Bob told him, only in spots. Hmm, and these books and pictures in Mr. Terrell's library, they don't look very dusty. Well, they were a little dusty, Pete said, but not smothered in it, though. Hmm. Jupiter took a long look at the skeleton in the mummy case. The skeleton... Most unusual legacy. At that moment, the whole trailer that contained headquarters seemed to shake. A piece of iron stacked outside slipped and rattled against it. An extra loud blast from Mr. Jones's new pipe organ had almost lifted them off the ground. Wow, Pete exclaimed. I thought it was an earthquake. Uncle Titus doesn't know his own strength when it comes to playing a pipe organ, Jupiter commented. If he's going to keep on like that, we might as well break up this meeting. But before we do, here's something for you. He handed each of them a long piece of chalk. It was like the chalk they used in school, except that Pete's piece was blue and Bob's was green. Well, what's this for? Pete asked. For marking trails with the signature of the three investigators. Jupiter took some of the white chalk and drew a big question mark on the wall. That means, he said, that one of the three investigators has been here. The white color tells that it was the first investigator. A blue question mark would mean Pete, the second investigator, and a green one would mean you, Bob. If I had thought of this sooner, you wouldn't have gotten lost in Terror Castle. You could have marked your trail with question marks and followed them back. Geez, you're right, Pete said. Observe the simplicity of it, Jupiter told them. The question mark is one of the most commonest signs. If someone sees a question mark chalked on a wall or a doorway, he thinks some child has been playing and forgets about it. Yet to us, the question mark will convey an entire message. We can use it to mark a trail indicating a hiding place or to identify the home of a suspect. From now on, never be without your special chalk. They promised they wouldn't, and Jupiter got down to the meat of the meeting. I telephoned Mr. Hitchcock's office, he said. Henrietta told me that tomorrow morning 
he is meeting his staff to decide whether or not to go to England to film his picture in a haunted mansion over there. That means we have to make our report to him by tomorrow morning, which means... No, <laughs> Pete yelled. I won't do it. As far as I'm concerned, Terror Castle is haunted and it can stay that way. You don't need any more proof. While lying in bed thinking, Jupiter went on, I have reached a certain conclusion that must be tested and we will have to work swiftly to report to Mr. Hitchcock in time. Therefore, you must both get permission to stay out late tonight, for tonight we make our final assault upon the secret of Terror Castle. Chapter 14. A Ghost and a Mirror Terror Castle loomed in the darkness above Jupiter and Pete. There was no moon, just a few stars to relieve the ebony blackness of the canyon. It won't get any darker, Jupiter said, his voice hushed. We might as well go in. Pete carried the new extra-powerful torch he had bought out of his allowance. His old one was still up there, up in the library. They walked up the broken steps and across the tile terrace. Jupiter limped slightly, favoring his tightly taped ankle. Their footsteps seemed very loud in the darkness. Somewhere, a small animal was frightened out of its hiding place and went streaking away from the beams of their torches. Whatever that is, it's a small whatever that is, Pete said. It's getting out of here. Jupiter didn't answer. He had his hand on the front door and was tugging. It wouldn't budge. Lend a hand, Jupiter said. This door is stuck. Pete grabbed the big brass handle, too. Suddenly, something gave. The brass handle came off in their grasp. Together, they tumbled backwards and fell into a heap on the files. Ugh, Pete grasped. You're laying on my stomach. I can't move. I can't breathe. Get off, quick. Come on, Jupe. Jupiter rolled over and got to his feet. Pete stood up, testing himself for broken bones or dislocations. I guess I'm all here, he said. Except, my good sense, I left that at home. His partner was examining the brass door handle under his torch. Look, he said. The screw that holds the knob to the rod that goes through the lock came loose. Been a lot of traffic through here in the last couple of weeks, Pete muttered. Maybe just wore out. Hmm. His stocky partner's face was set in a thoughtful scowl. I wonder if it could have been loosened. Who would do a thing like that? Pete asked. Anyway... We can't go in, so we might as well go back, right? I'm sure we can effect an entrance elsewhere, Jupiter said. Suppose we try one of those French windows down there. He moved along the front wall of the building. Half a dozen tall French windows faced directly onto the terrace. The first five were securely locked, but the sixth was open half an inch. Jupiter pulled. It opened easily like a door. Behind it was an impenetrable darkness. The darkness, however, was partially dispelled by Jupiter's torch. He pointed the beam in through the open window, showing a long table with chairs placed around it. At the far end of the table, there were apparently dishes. Ah, the dining room, Jupiter said in a low voice. We can enter here. Inside the beams from the torches roamed around, Pete half turned and gulped in fear. The room, showing fine carved chairs, a long mahogany table, an elaborate sideboard and carved wooden paneling on the walls. There seems to be several doors, Jupiter remarked. I wonder which we should take. As far as I'm concerned, ugh, Pete let out a strangled exclamation as he half turned and saw a woman in long flowing robes looking at them. She wore clothes such as Pete had seen in pictures pointed, painted 300 years before and tied around her neck was a rope. The unattached end of the rope fell down across the rope to her feet. She had her hands tucked into her flowing sleeves and was looking at the boys with an expression of sorrow. Pete reached out and tugged at Jupiter's jacket. What is it? Jupiter asked. L look, Pete stuttered. We aren't alone. We have company. Jupiter turned and Pete felt him stiffen. That meant he saw her too. The woman who was watching them, not moving, not breathing, just standing there watching. Pete guessed he knew who she was all right. 
She was the ghost of the woman Mr. Rex had told them about, the one who had hanged herself to avoid marrying some man her father wanted her to. For a moment, the boys remained frozen. The ghostly apparition neither moved nor spoke. Shine your light that way, Jupiter whispered. When I say now. Together they turned their torches toward the standing woman. She vanished as silently as she had appeared. There was nothing there now but a mirror, which reflected the light back into their eyes. A mirror, Pete burst out. Then she must have been behind us. She whirled, he whirled around, zigzagging his light back and forth, but there was no one there except for themselves. She's gone, Pete said, and I'm going too. That was a ghost. Wait. His stocky partner grabbed his wrist. Apparently, we saw a ghostly reflection in the mirror, but we may have been mistaken. I'm sorry we acted so hastily. We should have taken more time to examine the unusual phenomenon. More time, Pete yelled. All right, why didn't you photograph her? You're carrying the camera. So I am, Jupiter sounded chagrined, and I forgot all about using it. It wouldn't have shown you anyway, anything anyway. You can't photograph a ghost. Likewise, a ghost can't reflect in a mirror, Jupiter told him. But this one either did or else she was inside the mirror itself. I never heard of a mirror ghost. I wish she'd show herself again. That's your opinion, not mine, Pete retorted. All right, we proved Terra Castle is haunted. Now let's go and tell Mr. Hitchcock. We've just begun, Jupiter said. There is much to be learned yet. We must proceed further. This time, I won't forget the camera. I'm very anxious to photograph the blue phantom playing the ruined pipe organ. His partner's calmness helped to steady Pete. He shrugged. All right, he said. But aren't you going to mark our route with the chalk? Jupiter gave another exclamation of annoyance. You're quite right, he said. I shall repair the omission at once. He stepped to the window by which they entered and chalked a large question mark on it. Then he chalked a similar, similar mark lightly on the dining room table, being careful not to mar the surface. After that, he stepped onto the big mirror to the wall and he put the three investigators special mark on it. So that if Worthington and Bob should come after us, they will have their attention drawn to it, he told Pete as he pressed hard to make the chalk show on the polished glass. In case we're never seen again, you mean? Pete asked. Jupiter did not answer. Under the pressure of his hand, the tall mirror swung silently back like a door. Beyond it lay a dark passageway leading deep into Terror Castle. Chapter 15 The Fog of Fear The two boys stared at the dark passage in astonishment. Golly! Pete said, a secret passage hidden behind a mirror. Jupiter's brow was furrowed. Hmm, we must investigate this. Before Pete could utter a protest, the stocky first investigator had stepped through the opening where the mirror had swung back, and he was playing a beam of light down the long, narrow passage. It seemed to be just a hallway. The walls were rough stone, and there were no doorways except at the far end. Come on, Jupiter said. We must discover where this passage leads. Jupiter joined him. He didn't exactly want to enter that secret passage, and he didn't want to be left alone, either. It was better to have company, he decided. Jupiter was carefully examining the stone walls with his torch. Now he turned back again and began to investigate the mirror door. It appeared to be a normal mirror, set into the surface of a concealed wooden door. There was no knob and no latch. Curious, he muttered. There must be some secret means of opening the door. He swung it shut. There was a firm click, and they were shut into the narrow passageway. Now you've done it, Pete yelled. You've locked us in. Hmm. His partner tried to figure some finger hold by which to pull the door open. There was none. The back was smooth wood, fitting snugly so that there was scarcely a crack into which to insert a fingernail. Definitely there must be a secret means of opening the door, he said. I wonder why it opened so easily when I touched it just a minute ago. Never mind that, 
Pete told him. Let's see you easily open it again. I want to get out. I'm sure that if an emergency arose, we could break through this wood and then the glass through the glass mirror, Jupiter said, running his fingertops across the wooden backing of the door. However, it should not be necessary. We want to go in the other direction. Pete was on the point of telling him that the opinions expressed were not necessarily those of the second investigator, but already Jupiter was moving down the narrow passageway, tapping the walls with his knuckles. Hmm, solid, he remarked as he moved along. But there is a suggestion of hollowness beyond the stone. Listen. He rapped again. Pete listened, and he heard something. He heard the far-off sound of the big ruined pipe organ beginning to play. That weird wheezing tone seemed to fill the narrow passage, coming from all directions at once. Listen to that, Pete exclaimed. The blue phantom plays again. I hear it, the other boy told him. Jupiter put his ear against the wall of the passage and held it there for a long moment. The music seems to be coming through the stone wall, he stated. I'd say we're probably directly behind the ruined pipe organ in the projection room. You mean the blue phantom is on the other side of that wall? Peter yelped. I hope so, Jupiter said. After all, the whole purpose of tonight's expedition is to meet the phantom and to take his picture and, if possible, interview him. <gasps> uh, interview him? Pete groaned. You mean actually talk to him? If we can catch him. But suppose he catches us, Pete demanded. That's what worries me. I must repeat, Jupiter sounded rather severe now, that according to all available records, the Blue Phantom has never harmed anyone. I am basing my entire strategy upon this point. During my stay in bed, I came to some conclusions about this case. I have kept them to myself in order to verify them. I think we will soon find out whether I am correct or not. But suppose you're wrong, Pete asked. If you're wrong and the Blue Phantom decides he wants us to join his gang of spooks, then what? Then I admit I'm wrong, Jupiter said. But I will make one prediction now. In a few moments, we will begin to feel a sensation of extreme terror. <gasps> In a few moments? Pete yelled. What do you think I'm feeling now? Merely nervousness. The extreme terror is about to come. In that case, I'm about to go. Come on, let's bust that mirror and get out of here. Wait! Jupiter grasped his wrist. Let me remind you that fear and terror are merely feelings. You will be terrified, but I assure you no harm will come of it. While Pete was trying to answer that, he became aware of the strange change inside the secret passage. Unnoticed, while they listened to the weird music beyond the wall, curious wisps of fog had suddenly appeared in the air. They were all over along the floor, along the walls, along the ceiling. Pete flashed his light up and down. In the bright beam, the wisps of fog swirled slowly, coming together in weirdly, weirdly sinuous coils and circles. As he looked at them, they seemed to form strange and sinister forms in the air. Look! Pete's voice wavered. I can see faces! And there's... And there's a dragon, and a tiger, and a fat pirate. Steady, Jupiter said. I can see strange images too, but they are just the product of our imagination. It's the same as lying on a hillside and watching the clouds. The eyes turn them into all kinds of creatures. This mist is perfectly harmless, but I believe the extreme terror is about to begin. He gripped Pete's hand and Pete gripped back. Jupiter was right. Suddenly, he felt fingers of terror running into every part of his body, from his scalp down to his toes. His skin seemed to quiver with the awful sensation. Only the fact that Jupiter must be feeling it too, and was standing as steadily as a rock, kept Pete from racing back and hammering wildly on the mirror that blocked the passage. As the sensation of terror swept over them, the fog thickened, twisting and turning in fantastic images in the air. The fog of fear, Jupiter said. 
His voice shook a little, but he stepped for forward firmly. Reported once before, many years ago, the ultimate manifestation of Terror Castle. But let us try to get out and catch the Blue Phantom while he thinks we are paralyzed with fear. I can't, Pete managed to mumble through his clenched teeth. I'm paralyzed. I can't make my legs move. Jupiter paused. The time has come to tell you what I have deduced while forced to stay in bed, Pete, he said. I deduced that Terror Castle is really haunted. That's what I've been telling you all along, Pete said. It's really haunted, but not by a ghost. It's haunted by a man who is very much alive. In fact, the Phantom of Terror Castle, according to my deductions, is Mr. Stephen Terrell, the supposedly dead movie star himself. What? Pete was so surprised he forgot the feeling of terror. You mean alive and living here all these years? Exactly. A living ghost scaring people away from his home so that he will not lose it. But how could he? Pete asked. I mean, we both know there's no sign that anybody ever comes or goes from here. How do you get food and supplies? I don't know. That's the one thing I want to ask him. But you understand. He's been scaring us on purpose, just to keep us away. He doesn't really want to hurt anybody. Does that make you feel better? Well, sure, Pete said. Even though I still have any my feeling that my legs want to go someplace else. Then let us complete our investigation by unmasking the phantom, Jupiter said. He started for the door at the end of the passage, and Pete found himself keeping step. Now that Jupiter explained it, the whole thing made sense. Stephen Terrell himself, the master of terror, living in the old castle all these years, frightening people away. They reached the door at the end of the passage. To their surprise, it opened easily. They stepped through the pitch darkness. The weird music was louder now, and from its echoes they knew they must be in a bigger room. The projection room, Jupiter whispered. Don't use your light. We want to surprise the phantom. Side by side, they felt their way along a wall and around a corner. Pete almost let out a wild yell when something soft and slithery swooped down and wrapped itself around his face and head. But it was just the rotten velvet drape that he had torn loose. He managed to free himself without making any noise. They rounded a corner, and there, halfway up the big room, they saw a shimmering blob of mystery blue light where the ruined pipe organ stood. They paused. In the darkness, Pete could feel his companion getting his flash camera set. We're gonna sneak up on him, Jupiter whispered, and take his picture. Pete looked in the shimmering light and suddenly felt sorry for Mr. Terrell. After all these years alone in this spooky castle, it was going to be a great shock to him to be unmasked. We might scare him, he whispered back. Why don't we call out his name so we all know we're here and give him a chance to understand that we only want to be friendly? A very fine idea. We'll walk slowly towards him while I call out to him. They began to move towards the blob of light and the spooky music. Mr. Terrell, Jupiter shouted. Mr. Terrell, we want to talk to you. We're friends. Nothing happened. The music kept on wheezing and wailing, and the blue blob kept on shimmering. They crept up a few feet, and Jupiter tried again. Mr. Terrell, he called. I am Jupiter Jones. Pete Crenshaw is with me. We just want to talk to you. At that, the music suddenly stopped. The shimmering blue blob moved. It soared gracefully upward toward the ceiling, and it hung there. Jupiter and Pete stood gasping up at the unexpected flight of the ghostly organist, and they were suddenly aware that someone was beside them in the darkness. Jupiter was taken totally by surprise, his camera still in his hand. Pete had just enough time to jam the on button of his torch into position. The beam of light revealed two men, one of average height, one quite short, both dressed in the flowing burdness of Arabs. 
Each of the man was casting something in white into the air. A large net came down over Pete's head. It knocked the torch from his hand, putting it out, and they enveloped him all the way to his feet. He tried to run. He caught his foot in the meshes of the net and fell to the carpeted floor. He rolled over, struggling desperately, and realized he was as though thoroughly trapped as any fish in a fishing net. The more he struggled, the more tightly he bound himself in the clinging loops of the net. Jupe! he yelled. Help! His partner did not answer. Rolling over and twisting his neck, Pete could see why. The two men had picked Jupiter up between them like a sack of potatoes. He, too, was thoroughly wrapped in a clinging net. Using a small lantern for light, they carried the stocky boy over their shoulders and legs across the room and disappeared through a door. His weight seemed to give them a certain amount of trouble. Hardly able to move inside the net that had trapped him, Pete lay on the floor and could see nothing in the darkness except the blob of light that shimmered high above him, up against the ceiling. It seemed to be pulsing, first getting larger and then smaller, exactly as if the blue phantom was laughing at him. <laughs>